Okay, hello and welcome to the, I forgot, I, I announced uh, the county to our recent colloquium at the School of Astrophysics. And it's very pleasure to see you again. I was not here uh, last week because I was traveling. And so uh, one thing is that this is the third continuity speaker from uh, Eisenberg Institute. So it proves that yes, we have done the MOU with the right institutions and they're constantly getting speakers and colleagues from their volunteer jobs. So thanks a lot to Dr. Tavish Bhatt. Dr. Bhatt did a big bachelor's and master's from Bishwaharati University. And then he went to PRL, the Physical Research Laboratory in Ahmedabad for his PhD. And after that, uh, he was a postdoc preparator. And then part, part period, he was an English. Uh, uh, so I think he can go to the also visiting us on Monday. And then he was there at, at in China, in the government uh, in Beijing. And then he joined uh, as a faculty member at the same board in 2021. So that was just you know, barely a year of the uh, Yeah, just a year uh, before he joined the faculty of the Kimbos Institute. So it's a great pleasure to have Professor Tapus Bang, and he's going to tell us uh, on formation of massive stars, observational signatures of newly evolved theories. Without further ado, let's go. Okay, good afternoon to all of you, and thank you very much for this nice introduction. So, as my title says, that uh, I'm mainly going to talk about the formation of massive stars, mostly uh, the observational signature. I will not go into the detail of theories or equations, mainly how we are matching our observations uh, to the proposed theories. That's what I, I'm going to talk about. So this is the outline of my talk. So first I'm going to talk about how uh, the for, something about the formation of the stars, then why the massive stars are important and why do we need to study massive star formation. Then two of the currently evolved theories and which uh, I personally have observational support to do those theories. And then we are moving to much finer details with the available of a new telescope, which is Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array Telescope. So I'll talk about that also in towards the end of my talk. So <clears throat> if you look up to the sky, so we see a cl in clear night sky, you see plenty of stars. Now, even as a child, um, to a child's mind, the question comes up, are they all same? So that, that is the question, are they all same? And the answer to that is that they are not same. If you, there are many variants, there are many uh, different mechanism, different uh, scenario where they are not same. I'm talking about particularly one, about the mass. If we plot the stars in a particular diagram, which is very well known to astronomy, that Hertzsprung Russell diagram, HR diagram, so which says, uh, which plots the stars temperature in negative direction versus the luminosity. If we plot them, then depending on their mass, they fall in different zone in this HR diagram. So this particular strip in the middle, which is known as main sequence strip, so that where they will fall, so main sequence strip means the star that are fusing hydrogen inside their core and are in hydrostatic equilibrium, like our sun. So here is the position of sun. As you can see in this main sequence strip, there are stars that have mass lower than sun. And also there are stars that have mass more than sun or massive than, mass higher than sun. So that tells that where they will fall in this particular strip, the primary determining factor is mass. So that is the takeout from this slide. So now, it comes, okay, we see that there are different types of mass and different types of stars. Now the question is, what is the distribution? Are they all same in size or same in number? The distribution, it was classical work by Sol Peter in 1955, who plotted the mass distribution, the logarithmic scale in, so x-axis shows the mass in logarithmic scale and y-axis shows the number of stars in every mass bin. 
Of course, this is not a plot from uh, Solpeter. This is a recent work. But what Solpeter says that the distribution of mass, if we plot them, the mass bin versus the mass, they particularly follow a power law with a slope of minus 2.35. So what does it mean? So it means actually there are plenty of low mass stars compared to massive star. For example, here you can see per 200 sun-like stars, only 110 solar mass star. So that eventually implies that we have much less number of massive star compared to the low mass stars. Okay, so before moving into the further detail about their formation, uh, so where do stars form? Because stars don't form everywhere or every part of the galaxy. They particularly form in certain zone of the galaxy, in certain region of the galaxy, which are known as molecular cloud. So those are known as dense giant molecular clouds. So by dense, I mean 10 to the power four to 10 to the power six particles per centimeter cube. Of course, if you know the density, air density in mean sea level, that is about 10 to the power 20 particles per centimeter cube. So compared to that, this is much, much thinner, but this is called dense because compared to the surrounding of that particular cloud, it is denser because there the particle density often reaches one particle per centimeter cube. So that is one, that's why you call them dense. And also the temperature is very cold, 10 to 40 Kelvin. Okay, so this image of, of course, most of you have seen already. So this is uh, after the launch of JWST. So this is the nursery of star forming region. So this is typical molecular cloud where stars do form. Okay. So now we also, if, if you are lucky enough to get a clear sky or if you move to hill station, you could, you could be able to see a star forming region by naked eye. This is the Orion constellation. And if you zoom in this part, belt and uh, sword of Orion, then you could be able to see a star forming region there, this region. And the most interesting part of the star forming region is that for this particular region, this is the nearest massive star forming region to us. This is located at about 500 parsec from us. So this is the nearest star form, massive star forming region to us. Okay, so now I'll move to the formation mechanism. So formation mechanism, as I said, there are different mass range of stars from low mass to high mass. And formation mechanism for low mass stars or intermediate mass star, so meaning that the stars which have, which have mass less than eight solar mass, the mechanism is quite well understood theoretically as well as observationally. So what is that mechanism? So this is typical conjecture of how low mass stars do form. So this is this all this happened in dark cloud as I mentioned before. So the cloud fragments into smaller substructure which are known as core and they are gravitationally unstable in general if they need to form stars. So the gravitational collapse occur in that core and because of the angular momentum, they create flattened disk and the central and also develop a central seed or which is known as protostar. So they accrete gas from the surrounding envelope onto that protostar through this, through this flattened disk. But in the meantime, since it is accreting through a disk, so it is transferring angular momentum onto that central star. So that will speed up the rotation of the star. So somehow it has to be stabilized. So that how, how it could be stabilized. So it could be stabilized by throwing away some material through the pole of that star, which can take away extra angular momentum and stabilize the star or reduce the rotational speed. So that is the typical low mass star forming scenario. And over time, this particular disk will dissipate and finally, it will come as a main sequence star that is burning hydrogen inside their core with sometime planetary system around it. So this is the typical signature star forming scenario for low mass stars. But when we move to the domain of high mass star, by high mass star, I mean the stars that have mass more than eight solar mass, the understanding is very much poor. What are the problems? So there are problems in both ways, not only in the side of theory, but also observationally. So in theory, as you can 
understand so these are massive star means they are stars that have mass more than eight solar mass so that means they need to acquire a large amount of gas but if they start accreting at a rate like low mass star then at certain point the central part will reach the temperature to fuse hydrogen so once that central part reaches the temperature when they can fuse hydrogen and they can create energy so that radiation will dissipate the surrounding gas and halt further accretion so that means the accretion rate has to be rapid before that central part reaches the fusion temperature but when it, if the star accretes at a such high rate, that it means it is transferring angular momentum also very high rate. That makes the system very unstable. So that challenges the theory of massive star formation. So how the system could be stabilized with a high accretion rate and the, also it should not disrupt because of high rotational speed. So that is the challenge in theory. And observationally, it is also difficult because observation cannot support some theories because as I mentioned, there are plenty of low mass star compared to high mass star. So that means statistically, if we want to find a high mass star forming region, they are located at further distances than a low mass star forming region. So that makes observationally challenging to acquire the information from a massive star forming regions. And also massive star formation generally occur in clustered environments. So they form when they, if there is a massive star, a star with uh, eight solar mass, more than eight solar mass, then they are always associated with many other stars that have lower mass, lower than eight solar mass. So mainly they form in clustered environment. If we want to resolve such structures, then we need telescope that have very high resolution. That is also not always possible with the current observational facility. So that, so in one sentence, what I can say, for low mass star forming region. So another point is that massive star form when we, for low mass star, we can actually see several of the pre-main sequence phases. Pre-main sequence phases means when they are not burning hydrogen and in hydrostatic equilibrium. For low mass stars, we could actually see them using different wavelength telescope. But for massive star, all these events happen because they are shorter lived. So that's why all these events happen when they are behind the thick molecular cloud. So in a sense, we can see all these phases. This is the main sequence phase. We can see all the phases for low mass stars, but when we see actually a massive star, they are already in the main sequence. We cannot see when how they have formed observationally. So these are the challenges in massive star formation. But then someone may ask, why do you need to study massive star? Because they are very less in number. Only if we count only 0.4% by number. Um, in our galaxy, only 0.4% massive star compared to the low mass stars. But why then do you need to care about them? So we need to care about them because they are the primary source of ultraviolet radiation. Low mass star cannot generate such amount of ultraviolet radiation like a massive star so and also stellar winds i'm not going into the detail how the stellar wind generates but these are the very energetic part of a massive star formation which can influence surrounding gas for further star formation so that is one impact and also these massive stars they are the only star that can fuse heavier elements inside their core in fact whatever the heavier element like iron and all we are seeing on Earth at some point that has been produced at a core of a massive star. So that exploded as supernova mixed with surrounding gas where Earth has formed and we are using those iron. So that's how they, it is also important. And also, as I mentioned, because of the strong ultraviolet radiation and stellar winds, they may trigger for, further star formation on their surrounding gas because they can influence the uh, surrounding gas for to be gravitationally unstable and collapse. And also their heavy mass, have high luminosity, higher temperature. So lum higher luminosity means they can be easily detectable towards the larger distances like external galaxy. So they are important when someone is studying external galaxies. And also they are easily detectable if something is behind the cloud then high luminosity stars 
have much pro more probability to be detected compared to the low luminosity stars. And that's how it um, in 70s and 80s, uh, Gangel and Group, they have tracked the massive star and also measured the mass and exact position of the supermassive black hole at the center of Milky Way, which won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. Okay, so now it is a little bit clear that why do we need to study massive star formation? Now, what are the available theories for the formation of massive star? So there are certain two sets of theory, I should say. So one set of theory believes the core accretion scenario. Core accretion scenario means cloud fragments into smaller substructure, which is core, and their massive core will lead to the formation of massive star. Low mass core will lead to the formation of low mass star. So like low mass star formation scenario. So where when it fragments and creates smaller cores, then it has no interaction with the outer cloud. Only the core will provide the required mass to that star. So that is the core accretion mechanism. So it will accrete mass with a high rate to the central star, central protostar, and uh, flourish as a massive star. So that is the core accretion scenario. So another theory says that competitive accretion. By competitive accretion, I mean stars form in clustered environment, as I mentioned, along with several loma stars. So together that cluster may create a common gravitational well, and then they accrete gas not only from the core, but from the cloud scale, bringing gas into that potential well. And massive star located at the gravitationally favorable position where it can get or acquire most mass. And that way they form massive star along with a cluster of low mass star surrounded, uh, surrounded that massive star. So these are the two basic theories proposed and uh, several other theories which are not popular or uh, proposed like two small protostar merge together to form a massive star. So these theories didn't get, particularly this merging protostar didn't get much observational evidence, but these two theories kind of still alive and there is a strong debate in that. Uh, one yeah. Is there any uh, discussion that when fragmentation happens, when some fragments are bigger and some are smaller, and that will sort of determine what kind of stars yeah. will Yes, there is a study in that. Uh, so I did not add those slides here because so yeah, so now there is a study going on using particularly ALMA data. So there is mass function that uh, Sol Peter mass function versus the core mass function. So in the case of core accretion scenario, since we're there we are saying that each core leads to form a um, single star. So it is providing that mass. So then we expect the same slope of core mass function with the initial mass function, that's all Peter's slope. But if we are saying that, okay, it is not, the core is not isolated, core is accreting gas from outside the cloud, then the slope will change over time. So that is active research. Uh, some studies found similar slope, some studies found uh, different slope. So, and it is still going on. So I will be mainly talking about these two theories, collision between molecular clouds and accretion through filaments. Both these theory fall in the subclass of competitive accretion. So, so they accrete gas from cloud scale. Mike Myers? Is this Mike? Yes, Mike Myers. There is also Adam Myers who is a galaxy Yes. But uh, before moving into the detail of, as I mentioned, this will be mostly observational signature of massive star formation. So what do you need mean by observation? So in a star forming region, we generally do multi wavelength study not like in optical or infrared. We need to do multi wavelength study, but why? For example, if you want to understand a cake, so cake made of several ingredients, like, and you can go to a bakery and you can know what are the ingredients, like flour, butter, eggs, etc. But to an astronomer, the only information carrier is photon, nothing else. We cannot do anything there. So what we can do, 
we can study the photons at different wavelength and those photons are actually bringing the information of different mechanisms and different scenarios like here you can see the same thing if you see in different wavelength they are showing the different information of the same picture and also i don't know how many of see have have you seen this milky way from kolkata of course this is visible if you go out so this this is how milky way sees by naked eye in optical bands but when we plot milky way in different bands like starting from radio to ultraviolet or gamma ray then the changes how the milky way the gas distribution because the emission in radio the mechanism is different which is emitting in the infrared or optical bands so that's how we need to do multi wavelength study because in a star forming region the general entities are there are several things happening in the star forming region so mostly they are composed of young sources which could be easily detectable in optical and infrared bands there could be warm gas because those newly formed star is creating heat and that warms up the surrounding gas so those are generally detected in the mid and far infrared bands and also if you want to study the distribution of the molecular gas generally molecular gas we could see in the millimeter bands and also ionized gas so when it ionizes the surrounding gas uh, it creates the ionized hydrogen that is uh, the recombination line is detectable in the centimeter band like famous 21 centimeter line and also if you want to study magnetic field then you need to go for polarization observations and several different things are happening because this is kind of cooking everything so several different things several turbulence many things are happening there and you need if you want to full access to that you need to see a star forming region in multi wavelength so that's why in general you will see star forming papers are mostly multi wavelength papers for example here this is a dark nebular cloud in the optical nothing is seen in this dark patches but when we compare it to the near infrared band then you can see there are several store sources which are not visible in the optical band because they are obscured by that cloud their background source which is visible in the infrared band and star formation has been evolved over the years initially in 80s uh, there was a satellite which is known as uh, infrared astronomical satellite iras that has revealed most of the infrared bright sources then after that in 2003 nasa launched this pitzer space telescope which uh, operated in the near infrared and mid infrared bands and this particular telescope has revealed the star forming region has full of this kind of structure ring like structures and these ring like structures are mostly produced by the influence of massive star in general this ring like structure at the center there will be a massive star so they actually pinpointed this pitzer the where the massive star forming regions are then after that so there are couple of examples like there could be a ring like shape there could be elongated they could be broken depending on the influence of the massive star then after this herschel came in herschel is or operate in the far infrared band from about 70 micron to uh, 500 micron so there it and it was launched in uh, 2009 by isa and this particular revealed one interesting feature that all the galactic molecular clouds they have some particular structure this kind of elongated filamentary structure i will talk about this filaments in greater detail in the subsequent slides so this actually opened up a new era in star formation now these filaments are becoming more and more important as important as we are going deeper to it okay so whatever we understood so far the basic problem in star formation massive star formation is that it has to accrete a large amount of gas in shorter time scale so that is all i just wanted to con convey throughout the this part of my talk and the theory is proposed one theory i am saying that cloud cloud collision could do that and filamentary accretion could do that so first i am taking up the cloud cloud collision so in this particular collisional model so for example if one blob so this is small blob and surrounded by a larger cloud which is not shown here so when it is 
colliding, they create a shock wave. And that shock wave actually distorts the magnetic field present there because magnetic field lines are coupled with the dust particle in that cloud. So that will, that will be distorted and create a kink. So then, and that distortion will create a channel to gas flow along the magnetic field lines onto that kink with a heavy accretion rate. And that could provide the required accretion rate for the formation of massive stars. So this is the general formalism, how cloud cloud collision could lead to the formation of massive star. Of course, this cannot happen everywhere. This also needs a certain strength of magnetic field. If it is below than that, then this mechanism will not happen. Okay. Now, as an observational astronomer, I, I will not... I will always try to look for what is the observational signature for this. So what is the observational signature? So this is the schematic process. Small cloud is colliding with a larger cloud and create a compressed layer where the massive stars are being formed. And that because massive stars radiate high amount of ultraviolet radiation, which dissociate first dissociate the molecular hydrogen into atomic hydrogen and also ionize that hydrogen atom. Um, so that will create H2 region. In astronomy, it is known as H2 region, ionized hydrogen region. So observationally, I will see a broken like this kind of feature, the bubble filled up with H2 ionized gas. So that is one of my observational signature. And another signature is shown here. When we are observing in the line of sight, one cloud is coming to me and another cloud is going away to me then it will create a compressed layer where massive stars are being formed. But the observational signature will be if I plot the position along the line of sight and the velocity of that in Y axis, then we could be able to see two peaks for two, the two clouds. One is blue shifted peak, another one is red shifted peak, and they are joined by this compressed layer, which is generally low intensity bridge-like feature. So that's what my observational signature, in fact, that has been seen observationally earlier. This is one peak, this is another, and joined by broad beach feature. So now I will show you an example study, uh, which is N N37 molecular cloud. Go, don't go by this nomenclature. So this nomenclature is uh, to pinpoint where the region is located. So this is the important thing. So this is actually a Spitzer 8 micron images, the 8 micron band. So this shows this bubble-like feature, broken bubble. And when I checked the radio images or the centimeter wavelength images, then I saw that it is filled with ionized gas. So How this, was it was uh, archival from BLA. Yes. Um, yes, it was from BLA. Yeah. I was too conf confused with GMRT. No, it, is, it was from BLA. So, then it is filled up with ionized gas. So that gives my first signature that it could be a potential site for collision between two molecular clouds. But yet, not yet convincing that this could be just random event. So we need to check further. So it at least confirms there is gas which is bubble-like shape filled with ionized gas. Now I'm checking for the molecular cloud, whether I'm getting the other signature, that collisional signature. So when I check the molecular cloud at different velocity, I saw that there are two clouds present in that region, which is the host region. So one is blue shifted part, which is particularly this part of the cloud. And another one is red shifted part of the cloud, which is the top. And these are the location. There are two massive stars actually, which I, I'm not showing here. These were spectroscopically identified. So there are two massive stars located at the junction of these two clouds. Then I constructed the position velocity diagram and here you can exactly see the signature. One is blue shifted part of the cloud. Another one is red shifted part of the cloud and they are joined by low intensity broad beach feature. So this shows that the star formation, the, the exact signature which was expected from the schematic scenario. So this shows that the, in this region, star formation has happened or the OB star, by OB star, I mean the stars that are mass, more massive than eight solar mass. So they have formed by the collision between two molecular clouds. And later, 
this uh, Japanese group, uh, Yasuo Fukui and all, they have found this coalitional scenario in about 50 to 60 regions where the pollution between molecular clouds have formed massive stars. They are still molecular, otherwise we will not get uh, this signature. So the massive charts have formed, but they have, they have seen... Uh, yeah, they have only ionized the... Nearby. Nearby, yeah. Mm -hmm. This part of the cloud. So they, because they have ionized, that's why this part... So one peak we are seeing for red shifted, one peak we are seeing for blue shifted. But in between, the intensity is low because they are already ionized because of the influence of massive stars. So they are not emitting in the millimeter band. So they are emitting in other bands. So that's why the intensity and in the... Signatures of ionized gas there? Uh, yeah, that uh, in the previous slide, actually, it is filled up with ionized gas. So if I plot that here, yes, the, then ionized gas is just surrounding right. the massive stars. So this ionized gas, what is the signature? You are seeing 50 millimeter or? Yeah, 21 centimeter. 21 centimeter. Yes. 21 centimeter is neutral, I think. Sorry, um, 14 gigahertz, I don't know. You're seeing like 1.4 gigahertz, uh, that is 21 centimeter, pre free emission. No, 21 centimeter is neutral, I think. Recombination line, right? Yeah. 5 centimeter, so then, sorry, I was yeah confusing with that. So it is recombination line. But this is also like H alpha kind of thing, right? Yeah, H alpha observation. Uh, I'm not showing everything. H alpha is also superposed. Uh, means right. exactly superposition on this region. Means on the massive star, because this is mainly coming uh, from the recombination line. So H alpha is also seen. Okay. So now I'll move to the next part. Uh, and this is most uh, now becoming more and more famous, these filaments. So by filaments, many people understand many different things like who are uh, building up their body, they will understand this as a muscle. The electrician will understand this as a tungsten ball. 3D printer also this kind of, uh, the main material in 3D printer that is also known as filament. And for solar physicists, the elongated structure of the surface of the sun, that is known as filament. But to a star formation group, astronomer, yeah, they, those are megaparsec, parsec, kiloparsec, megaparsec scale filaments. But what I mean here, the star forming filaments, these are elongated overdense structures of the interest uh, ISM and have aspect ratio more than 5 to 10. And they are significantly overdense compared to the surrounding. This image I have shown you before on of this. So these are, and Herschel revealed the ubiquitousness of this filamentary structure in all galactic molecular cloud. Every galactic molecular cloud has this kind of structures. So this is some typical example here, everywhere you can see those kind of structures. So these are known as star forming filaments. These are. Uh, there are um, studies are going on how it has been, uh, it can be formed because I have shown earlier in the cloud cloud pollution. I didn't talk about that. So, actually, this half stop that you gave the part stop of the C show the image as well. Yeah, this I, I have in this particular slide, I have not talked about this. So, this cloud cloud pollution can also lead to the formation of filaments because the gas will be accumulated along the magnetic field lines. And if two clouds have different orientation, then they will create a filamentary structure. Because we think that the cardinal collapse will be very nice and symmetric and central, but it's not. Yes. It yeah. Turbulence will also create. Yeah, there are uh, several uh, theories actually. One theory says that it first colla collapse in one direction, so gravitational uh, accumulation occur in all one direction, like a seat, then in other direction. So that leads to the formation. But because we are all we are seeing in one dimensional means 
projection effect. We don't see that whether they are seat like structure or they are really like wire like structure. So that is one mechanism, but one very strong mechanism for the formation of filament is collision between molecular cloud or the interaction between molecular cloud. So this is actually the byproduct of collision between molecular clouds because magnetic field will align the gas or because magnetic field is coupled with the dust particles and they will be arranged depending on the orientation of the magnetic field, they will be arranged in the, along the magnetic field lines and that will lead to the formation of filaments. But it is still active research, how the filaments are formed. Okay, so now there are theories that after 2000, of course, after the Herschel era, uh, oh, I forgot to add that, this was proposed in 2010. So they say that these filaments are very important structure of star formation because they may create dense core along their long axis, which can eventually collapse and lead to the formation of low mass star. And also these filaments, multiple such filaments can create a common junction and accrete large amount of gas along their long axis to that common junction and create the favorable condition for the formation of massive stars. So this is the theory and several several such theories have been proposed in recent years, like in this particular scenario. So it is saying that accretion from cloud scale first occur to the long axis of the filament. And once they settle down in the filament, then the accretion occur along the long axis of the filament. So first across and then along the long axis. So just this uh, particular slide I'm showing, there are all this mechanism three at least I'm showing here, they are proposing different massive star formation mechanism, but the basic ingredient here is the filament. So detailed mechanism is different, but all of them are connected to the filamentary structures. So now, again, I'm saying that as an observational astronomer, I should always look for the signatures. So what are the signatures? If I want to study whether filaments are acting in a particular star forming region or leading to the formation of stars in there, then what are the signature I should look for? First, I'll look for a network of filaments and towards the central hub, there should be a formation of massive star. And also it should accrete, this filamentary structure should accrete gas onto that central hub. So these are the three signatures, at least I should look for. Okay, so I'm again giving one example of molecular cloud, which is surplus 53 region, galactic star forming region. So this is the star forming region. As you can see, they, they are filled with ionized gas and these stars are actually marked the location of massive star. So there are several massive stars present in this particular region. Now, when I looked into the distribution of the molecular cloud or molecular gas there, there are at least five filamentary structures were identified. So they, the, here the location of the massive star, okay, so probably I should. So these are the, again, galactic bubble, mid infrared bubbles marked by the yellow dashed line. So these are the location of the bubble. So as you can understand that there are at least several massive star in this particular area, which is located at the junction of at least five filamentary structures. Now the next step is whether these filaments are carrying gas onto that structure. That is that will be the main signature. Otherwise, this filament could be a random structure and we are seeing a massive star formation there. So how we can see wh <clears throat> whether it is flowing gas onto the central star. So you can think of a river. So when it starts from the hill, hill or mountains, then they are thinner as they are approaching to the sea, then they, their speed becomes slower and they become broader. So same things actually when you plot the position and velocity diagram. So this is the location of the hub in every this five filament. So the zero is the location of the hub. So as you can see, they were generally thinner and their velocity also reducing as they are approaching to the hub. And their profile is also getting broader like a river. So that imply this kind of feature. So uh, in star formation community, so what we are seeing there is a gradient in velocity and also 
this width changing so there is a dispersion of the velocity so these two together tells that there is a flow of gas from this direction to this direction so from the outer part of the filament so this is the location of the hub so this is the signature that there is a large scale flow of gas along the long axis of the filament which has probably so still it is probably lead to the formation of massive star okay so this kind of signature has been observed in many regions this is one of my previous study where we have found the formation of massive star at the junction of the filaments and in recent years also this is also another active research because so these filaments are recent so they several of the study has found the formation of massive stars at the junction of filament so i don't know whether lines are visible here so here is the formation of massive star and at the junction of at least six filamentary structures but this is all about the large scale filament by large scale filaments i mean the filaments that have parsec scale length so now this is not complete yet because what is the extent of role of filaments these are okay filaments are carrying gas to a common junction where massive star formation or any star formation is happening so we don't know yet whether and also theories have been proposed that filaments are actually carrying gas onto the core scale but that has not been found observationally okay so now every answer in scientific community leads to further questions so same same question here okay we have seen that parsec scale filaments are bringing gas to a common junction that is also parsec scale clump their multiple star formation is happening now we want to know whether filaments carry gas to the prestellar disk means the disk of the star formation so that's what we want to see of course a direct implication could be if we find a correlation between the disk accretion so star is accreting through disk and the filamentary accretion so filament is carrying gas to the disk and disk is accreting gas onto the star so that should be ideal but that is not possible because with the presence observational facility we cannot resolve individual disk and individual filament at that scale so which is much 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 finer scale compared to our current observational facility okay but there is a solution as i mentioned before that accretion through disk leads to the bipolar outflow so these outflows are actually high velocity energetic gas that throws away gas to a larger velocity away from the cloud so they are generally very easily detectable if we go in large velocity then we can detect those gas and study them so now how it can help so okay think about a conjecture so for example a filament is feeding a disk then because of the accretion through the, this disk actually lead to bipolar outflows so now if really the filament is feeding that disk then we should see a perpendicular orientation between this filament and the outflow axis so this is the simple conjecture and we would ideally look looking for whether the outflow happening from a protostar is perpendicular to the filamentary structures so that is our aim now let's how to uh, studies are performed with this belief of course but only belief could not lead to the observational study it also needs facility earlier there were no facility which could detect at that scale but now with alma atacama large millimeter sub millimeter array we could we are now able to resolve such structure like outflow finer scale outflow and the at that disk scale one could say means 0.1 per sec scale so now we are capable of performing such study so this is i don't know how many of you have seen these images this is not as not an easy image so this is actually protoplanetary disk all in... of them have seen it but i don't know how many remember mm -hmm. okay i have particularly thought of this <laughs> okay so this is this is actually a star protostar surrounded a planetary disk so this is uh very first images uh, or not the very first towards the first images which released by alma so this is and these gaps in there they are actually region where the planets are being formed 
So this is very high resolution image of a, uh, of course it is nearby region, only 140 parsec. So this region was first resolved by ALMA. And this is the telescope. So because of, so what I want to mention because of this unprecedented resolution and sensitivity, we are now capable of doing or performing such studies. I usually say that before event horizon telescope showed this images, this was the most yeah, fascinating image of the century. Yeah. Because you were seeing a solar system being formed. Yes. This is amazing. Yeah. Of course, event horizon has gone into different level, but but in that sense, event horizon telescope, one should ideally gather offline all the uh, information and then many models required. But for this, it is direct observation. Okay, this is, I'm just showing on example region, how outflows look like in a region. And you can see the resolution 0.1 parsec. I, earlier, we were talking of one parsec or tens of parsec. So now we are resolving much finer scale. So these are the outflowing gas. So these blue contours are actually showing. So this EOL are actually location of the protostar or the protostellar core. And that is leading to bipolar outflow often. So, and this blue color is actually showing blue shifted gas, blue shifted part of the outflow. And the red color is showing the red shifted part of the outflow. So now we are comparing that whether filament and outflow has a perpendicular orientation. So this is one of one such study which was performed in 2017. Of course, not using ALMA data, but almost similar resolution uh, submillimeter array data. So this <clears throat> uh, shows that random orientation of outflow. But this was not an easy task as it appears because when we are observing the angles, so we are actually and on the sky, they are actually two D projection of three D angles. So they so then how we can compare that? So how we can compare that? We can simulate 3D angle, then restrict, for example, restrict them to the perpendicular, say 80 to 90 degree, then calculate their 2D projection and compare with the observed histograms. So that, that's how it, it has been compared. You can see if they were all parallel, parallel means zero to 20 degree, if the filament and outflow, they are kind of parallel within zero to 20 degree, then the histogram should follow this line. If they are perpendicular, by perpendicular, I mean if they are 72, restricted to 70 to 90 degree, then the histogram should follow, 2D histogram should follow this. But here they are showing random orientation. Later, Kong Shuo et al. in 2019, they performed similar study in a massive star forming region and where they have found orthogonal. So they are following this line, the histogram. So now this opened up, okay, this is not yet conclusive. One region found random, another region found perpendicular. Then I also performed a similar study using the previous two studies were single region. Now I, I compiled 11 massive star forming region and performed the same study. And I found again a random to the filament. So the filament and outflow have no connection. So this study eventually says that. So there is no finer connection within the filament and the outflow or the accretion through the disk. Okay. So yes, these are massive star forming region. Yeah. So this is uh, fully based on ALMA data. Now I extended that study. This is uh, not yet published in preparation. So extended the study to much more region, 146 region. So when I compared the filamentary structure, so these filament are actually large scale filament. So far, everybody was comparing large scale filament, not very finer scale filament because filament can fragment into sub filaments. And again, for the sub sub filament, one can say. So that people are not comparing large scale filament and how the, they are oriented with respect to the, or outflows are oriented with respect to the filament. So that again, I found random, but the interesting part came in, as I mentioned, this is a paper uh, recently published. It shows the, how filaments are distributed in length at mass. So the main takeaway from here is that filament have 
So these are galactic star forming filaments. So these filaments have wide range 0 0.1 parsec to hundreds of parsec and mass of 0 0.1 solar mass to 10 to the power 6 solar mass. So they could be variety of them. So that means mass of per unit length they calculate means so assuming that the gas in local thermodynamic equilibrium and thin so then they in every velocity channel they kind of accumulate the column density and convert that to mass so oh, what this slide says that so far we were in this particular domain the study earlier alma study or whatever study filament outflow orientation but this filaments which are having a parsec scale length and mass of 100 solar mass they can fi fragment further and create sub filaments so what if a filament is there then the sub filament is produced that has different orientation compared to the main filament and that is actually feeding the central star then how it it will happen so then i performed identified the sub filament structures and then plotted the same thing you can see they are actually equally divided. 45% outflow are parallel to the filamentary structure, small scale filamentary structure, and 55 are perpendicular to the filamentary structure. And that actually lead to this formation scenario of filament and formation scenario of star. So this particular scenario, this is simulation. So it shows that first gas accretion occur from the cloud scale onto the filament across the long axis. If the gas accretion is occurring across the long axis, then feeding the accretion disk, then we expect outflow to be parallel to the filamentary structure. And when they settle down, the gas settle down in this filamentary structure, this simulation says then the gas moves along their long axis. So then in that case, Accretion disk will be oriented along the filament, filamentary axis, and outflow will be perpendicular to that. So this says that this particular formation mechanism of star, when gas accretion first occurred through the from the cloud scale to short axis, then along the long axis, that is probably feasible, and that is happening, maybe leading to the formation of star. So, so this study is still under preparation. Uh, so in summary, what I wanted to convey here, the massive star formation is still a uh, debate. I don't know how, am I very fast? Okay. Okay. So it's still an open debate. Uh, of course, it is getting more and more observational evidence and evolving as the new facilities are coming up. So cloud cloud collision, uh, which I mentioned in the first part, they are potential mechanism. Also, filament is now leading the leading from the point the star formation mechanism. But with the availability now with JWST and Alma together, they may take us to some other direction depending on how cleverly we use the observation how and how cleverly we observe them. So that all depends on uh, in the future actually. So with this, I will stop here. And thank you. Thank you very much. So it's time for questions. Questions. Yes. So Thank you. Okay, so I have two questions. So the first one is you talked about the junction of the filaments which will incorporate the massive star formation region. So once there the junction will incorporate the massive star formation. Uh, the role of junction here is that uh, the problem in massive star formation it has to gather large amount of gas in short time scale so then the multiple filaments which is creating the hub or the central junction so multiple filaments carrying gas together into that junction and providing large amount of gas which could create the favorable condition for massive star formation if one filament the rate of gas accretion through one filament is not sufficient. So multiple filament create a common junction. And then for example, if there are five filaments, then it is five times more, the accretion is five times more, then uh, that could create the sufficient condition for formation of massive star. So the next question is you talked about the study which 
you are doing currently. So the, the filaments which uh, broke into smaller fragments, and you talked about the uh, outflow and the filaments in the perpendicular. So did you talk that uh, the fragmented filaments should be perpendicular to the yes, not, not the main filament. Of course, uh, here the main filament are actually not showing any correlation. So they are random. But when I move to finer details, like the fragmented filament, then I'm seeing this bimodal distribution. So that says that filaments, how the, about all formation of the filaments and also how the gas is being carried to the protostar by the filaments. Thank you. Both. Thank you. That was a very nice talk. And Thank you. So you like the it. That is, so you said that uh, for large scale filaments, there is like no correlation around the, around the orientation, but for small scale, we're definitely seeing it. So like why can that happen to be in the for small scale or even there, we are seeing an orientation, but for large scale. Okay, so like... there is one unknown domain in massive star formation or in star formation in general, the orientation of magnetic field. So when you can see the magnetic field line structures, the small scale filaments are often oriented along the magnetic field lines. So that's why the large scale structure may not follow the magnetic field lines, but how they will fragment in smaller structures, the one parameter is magnetic field line and turbulence. So that's how they could be, for example, your large scale structure oriented like this this table, then smaller filament could be, might not exactly follow this along this line. They could be of different uh, structure depending on how the turbulence or how the hot, how hot the gas is there and also how the magnetic field lines are oriented. So that is the lower channel, which are, I'm not, I have not said the terminology. Those are known as fiber. So the actually the fiber are the coherent channel of the gas that transport gas onto the protostar. So they could not exactly follow the filament line or the orientation of the filament, but could be different depending on different parameters. So that's why when we compare with those fiber, then that is showing the bimodal distribution. Okay, so that's the magnetic filament. How much is the role of turbulence here? Turbulence actually can uh, be as high to rule out the role of the magnetic field also means it could be very hot then turbulence is so high that oh, it overrules the magnetic field uh, effect and that will determine so that depends on the temperature of the uh, gas whether there is a presence of surrounding massive star many factors are there because if there is a presence of massive star then they will heat up the surrounding gas and the turbulence will be more uh, so it uh, all depends on that and the domain is yet to be explored i would say this fiber is just coming up uh, only two or three papers have been published so far thank you so i have a question from the cloud cloud pollution bar so I understand that you, you found the uh, observational evidence and then uh, the, there is observational evidence uh, of the cloud cloud uh, position. But uh, you mentioned, I saw your paper which uh, say that which predicted that this cloud cloud position uh, will lead to a uh, star formation which is uh, greater than 10 to the power 8 uh, solar mass, uh, it can be 8 uh, uh, like, OB star with mass, uh, something like that. You predicted the mass. Eight eight solar mass. Solar mass. So, eight solar mass. so how did you uh, predict that solar, that mass of the star? Okay. And uh, did you measure the mass of the cloud? Like how, how, how uh, no, I didn't measure the mass of the cloud. So first answer is that uh, the mass of the stars are known because we observed the spectrum of those stars and we determine their spectral type so they are of o type or b type stars so which are generally massive stars so that is first course um, 
how we knew the there are these massive stars present. And to answer your the other part of your question, how we know that we also in that paper we estimated the magnetic field strength, so which was around one forty or one fifty micro gauss. I don't remember the exact value around that number. So if the model predicts if the magnetic field strength in a region where such collision between cloud is occurring, that has magnetic field strength of more than 100 micro gauss, then only it can produce massive star. Otherwise, it cannot. So since we measured that, so that was added in our conclusion that since it has magnetic field strength of this much, so it could be able to produce massive star. And the massive star, at least presence of two massive stars, uh, we uh, we actually have observations. We used uh, Himalayan Chandra telescope to take the spectra of those stars and then measure the how it spread calculated what is the spectral type and uh, then inferred okay this is these are the massive stars. So can we at all measure the mass of the clouds? Yeah, it is possible to measure the mass of the cloud. Um, as uh, Professor Chatterjee was asking, how we measure the so mass of the filament. So. There are certain assumptions since we have the uh, molecular line data. Molecular line data means in every spectral, smaller spectral frequency or wavelength, we have the emission. So we are actually changing the frequency and we are moving in the third dimension. So then we can assume that whatever the emission procedure that is optically thin and that is in local thermodynamic equilibrium, with that assumption, then we can use the modified black body estimate what could be the column density. Otherwise, if, if we don't add, assume the local thermodynamic equilibrium and optically thin, we cannot use the modified black body uh, equation to uh, estimate the column density. Once we have the column density, then it is easy. Okay, this cloud is present from this range to this range. Just add up the column density to get the total mass. Thank you, thanks. Okay, any other questions? Yes, uh, so... Uh, Again, I think I know you, but just good evening, Professor and all the audience. I'm Shibu Kishan, student of University. Well, my topic is rather on the literature part because uh, in that slide of the theory of massive star formation, in the classical theory, the first two uh, points are set, and then it was written the review. The review was the, the article. The, Okay. Oh, those are reviewers. So, where do you, where do you, review articles or? They, those are review articles, actually. Oh, okay. So the core accretion is known in 90s. Core accretion model. Both the theories are kind of came together. Um, 80s and 90s. So, there are a couple of many papers means which modified this theory so i remember the uh, main paper which uh, about this competitive accretion uh, theory which people cite more that was published in 2003 this is by mackie at all uh, but i don't remember about the core accretion the year so all this developed in 80s and 90s but if you read this uh, review paper yeah, so these are actually review papers are easier to find the older reference because they accumulate everything together and you get all the informations there. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Sandra? Yes, uh, so I was just curious on the first half, on the first few slides, I saw that we told about the general elements. So I want to know that. Uh, you told that the general elements on Earth must be is, is due to the massive star. Mm -hmm. So is it just a prediction? No, no, it's not. Point? This this is not prediction. This is a fact actually. So uh, massive star actually have the enough mass to keep on fusion of hydrogen to helium, helium to carbon nitrogen, and uh, subsequent up to iron. Of course, the elements heavier than iron that are produced in different methods. Um, those are known as R process and S process that could be happen in even in the surface of low mass star also. But uh, these are the main source which could produce the heavier elements, so these massive stars. 
So this is actually fact. It is not prediction or speculation. Sorry. So, sir, just one second. Have you studied stellar evolution in your class? No, I'm not. It is not here. Okay, so there you learn. Is it like all very much in your stellar? Yes. Okay. I think she asked that. I think you may have asked two questions of the final exam. <laughs> <laughs> so I think Santa was asking how they reach enough. Reach, reach here. Yes. Okay. Yeah. You want to answer the question? Yeah. Uh, I would love to. <laughs> yeah. So they actually at the end of their life they explode as a supernova. So that supernova explosion expels expel all the matter into the surrounding ISM interstellar medium, and that ISM further leads to the formation of stars. So this is like mixing with the ISM that is forming star again, and then mixing happen again, and that is also forming star again. So, and within that our Earth also formed. Yeah, so that's a much, much longer yeah, recurrence process. How does the supernova and PDF give to the higher levels to the Earth? So that's how the process goes. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah, metallicity. This is called metallicity yeah. also increases. If the binding energy starts heating gold into the virus, mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, then the value of gold will be like iron. iron. <laughs> gold dominant will be iron. Maybe iron. I iron was also pretty expensive because iron age. Yeah. So maybe iron or something else. We have been rare. Very attractive. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Yes, Harshi. So, uh, so these things this slide is already here. So these I mean, is there a reason to believe that I'm sure there is, but uh, that uh, these theories are not good enough? Uh, for example, if it's if heavy mass, heavier massive stars are formed just like a scaled up version of low mass star forming, but is, is there any observational reason to believe uh, that? Yes, so recent observation uh, is going on, mostly being published in 21 and 22. So they are showing, uh, as I mentioned, comparison of core mass. So I was mentioning that before. So cloud fragments with core of different masses. And the, in the core accretion scenario, the core is isolated core, gravitationally bound core, and that provide the required mass to the central star. So then whatever is happening, depending on the efficiency of gas transformation, uh, gas transfer from core to star, uh, maybe 10% of that mass transfer to the central star. So there will be slope. If we plot the core mass function of the core, like IMF, the Solpeter slope. So they will have similar slope. Only the efficiency of transferring gas will be that, that much different. The exact number might be different, but the slope will be same. But recent observation shows that the slope are not same. So that actually uh more and more uh, nullifying that uh, core accretion scenario and uh, i have another question so since i spend most of my time well most of my time that i'm supposed to research in thinking about uh, accretion uh, and the related outflow so uh, you know th that's quite messy in the sense that it may not always be exactly perpendicular or the outflow that you are measuring that that's not super collimated. There is some amount of you know, sort of diffusion as well. So you may not, the angle that one may measure yeah. that may not exactly be the angle that you are looking for. Yeah. So I, I thought I had that slide. Okay. So I don't have that slide. Actually, outflow could be angle could be different. Uh, but we generally use the tracer, um, or of course, assumption is there that it should be perpendicular. So outflows uh, might not always infer the direction of the jet. Jet is the actual one, which should be always perpendicular to the accretion or which, which should come out of the pole. And interaction of the jet actually uh, triggers the emission in other uh, molecules which we see in outflow. So they could be different, definitely. Uh, but in this narrow scale, uh, young outflow, we assume that, okay, they are actually inferring the direction of the jet. And of course, 
um, infer, okay, I'll show that image. That might be easier for me. Okay, we only believe in that because they are mostly bipolar. So that bipolar angle actually says, okay, they are following the jet uh, axis actually. If it is only one monopolar, then we cannot say exactly whether it is inferring the exact jet axis or different. But bipolarity means, okay, we are kind of confirmed they are following the jet axis. Well, I think, I think it was a very good talk. It was pitched at the exact right level, which okay. is accessible. <laughs> Thank you very much. But also not, uh, not, uh, yeah. yes, and the amount of material was also. Thank you. Thank you. Like it. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. Oh, no, no. And also, also. And also in some ice floor, I saw that you talked about the two pile, right? Yeah. The two pile. Yeah. Okay. So the two pile is another and the sort of small stuff. I mean this massive stuff. So how do you use two pile for that massive stuff? So we generally No no, this is not for you can see the Koopa, Koopa mass function distrib distribution mass of the mass function. That is not only for, of course, this is kind of incomplete in this region because uh, massive stars are rare, but this ranges up to 10 to the power 1.5 or so. So that means uh, they are more than, yes. So that, that is not exactly incomplete towards the massive side. Uh, so what was your question? I forgot. Yeah. That's why nobody is nullifying that statement. Of course, in this part, there is now question towards the lower mass stars, means brown dwarfs. Yeah. So there are now active research is going on. How the this part, as you can see, this part it is falling. Of course, there is issue of completeness yes. because. Uh, more fainter star you see yeah. they had to detect so that is incomplete but still it is um, maybe with JWST some more study may come in that direction yeah, so I answered general question that you said that like the theory of merging protesters that is pretty much ruled out to so what observation in cases mm, because uh, not only observation it is hard to detect of course how Merging event, if you compare the our observational time scale and the merging event time scale, we can never see a merging. But uh, theoretical study have been shown if they have merged together, then they have higher possibility to get disrupt. So theoretically, that is not a stable configuration for the formation of massive star. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? If not, I just have this one small comment. So this is regarding to Oluru's question on alignment of the smaller fragment. I mean, the smaller filaments compared to the larger one. And you said that there is this magnetic field and magnetic turbulence. So there must be some scale associated. I mean, when you say smaller, how small? That's the immediate question comes that there must be some scale. So, uh, it, it, so wait. Are there scales associated with the magnetic field? Is it the coherent scale or the turbulence? Uh, we have, uh, 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 over, I don't know how the turbulence is modeled in star forming regions, but overall scale fragment. So, is there any other physical scale involved? And we can say that, okay, you know, this is typically the scale above which you don't see alignment, and typically at this scale, you do see alignment. So, uh, I think you're very technical and uh, yeah. but I don't uh, I don't have uh, any answer to it actually. It's a valid question, <laughs> yeah, I this is this is what you ask is a valid question. So uh, like when it will get fragmented in yes. smaller filaments and uh, that could be uh, directly connect, connected yes. to the accretion disk. That's right. The fragmentation scale. That's the very. Uh, no, I don't have any answer to it. Only. Uh, one study that Hakar et al. did in probably 2016. So they uh, first uh, uh, 
coined that idea of fiber. So that was of the scale of 0.1 per second below. But I, yeah. frankly speaking, I don't have much answer to this. Great, thank okay. you. But you say that there are observations. He was also mentioning the Alma observations. Yes. Alma only is Alma is the only yeah. telescope that could yeah. that could resolve that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, if not, let's have a sticker for a better talk. Thank you very much. Yeah. You liked it. And he not for the right guy, right? Yes. So no, Alma was very complicated in the first few years, like 2011, 12 that. Yeah. Now it has become uh, better, or is it still? I mean, Alma is. Of, in, in, it seems that you have a lot of time around. Is, is that your own no. time? Or? No. <laughs> Alma is actually still complicated. But Alma is uh, holding. Yeah, it's good. 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 Yeah, it's